So in this chapter, we are going to be talking about biodiversity and conservation biology. This is chapter eight out of the Essential Environment textbook. So to start with, I wanted to get you to think about some human-centered reasons to want to conserve the environment or preserve lands. There's a lot of reasons that are very human-focused of why we would want to do that. Alternately, there are different reasons that are more earth-centered, why you would want to save the environment. And neither one of these lists are better or worse. It's just good to know that there's different reasons to preserve the environment. Some are more about, you know, centered on the earth and some are more centered on the needs of people. Um, so this is a really good um, video to watch about wildlife bridges called Wildlife Crossing Stop Roadkill. Why aren't there more? And that's on YouTube and it's from Vox and I would highly recommend watching that. It talks about um, how roads really split up migration patterns and stop breeding. They give it more access to poachers. And so um, you want to build as few of them as possible if you're really focusing on, on nature and the earth and animals. So there is, your book talks about at the beginning that there was a road planned to go through the Serengeti and gives you all the reasons why that would be a bad idea for um, several of the groups and animals and wildlife that are there. Um, so the chapter then goes into biodiversity and I tend to really like the ocean. So this was a video on just thinking about the biodiversity in the ocean. It's a TED-Ed called The Secret Life of Plankton. And then here is a second um, video um, called, I believe, um, How Does Life Start in the Deep Ocean? So let me see. Yes, How Does Life Begin in the Deep Ocean? Another way to just look at the diversity of the ocean. So biodiversity are all the genes that we have across all ecosystems on our planet and a specific species shares roughly the same enough type of genes that they can reproduce and create fertile offspring. So when we're looking at different ecosystems, we care about not just about species richness, that's how many of each species you have, but also that there's, there's a good abundance or amount of each species. So in other words, um, they have enough like to make a good breeding population matters as well. So if we look at these two communities, community one and community two, they both have the same species richness. They both have the same um, types of trees. However, um, community two, if this lighter green one was like a sycamore, say, this has a lot, they are a lot more abundant in sycamores, meaning sycamores are doing a lot better here. However, if you're just looking at community two, this type of tree, there's only one of it. And so it may or may not be able to reproduce. And so while there's the richness there, like that tree does exist, your chances of actually seeing it or it thriving over time are decreased. In other words, people might say that, that mountain lions live in Southern California, which is true, they will pass through here, but they're not necessarily extremely abundant with very many of them. Um, okay, so here's a different community picture where you can see that the species richness, like the amount of different types of species they have are the same, but abundance is different. And then here's just another picture. You can pause and look at those if you want. So genetic diversity is um, how different the, different the genes are within the same um, species of a, of like a population. So these, um, different animals here, while these are all the same species, you can see that they have very diverse, um, DNA. They're very different from each other. That means they're not, um, extremely inbred or anything like that. So they're probably going to be more disease resistant if things come through, if different problems arise. Um, Ecosystem diversity means how well and how diverse is the ecosystem that a, the whole area could survive if different um, problems come through. So you want kind of a diverse ecosystem as well. 
so in Southern California, where we are, we are actually in the California Floristic Province, and I put a link to that there. I highly recommend you go and look it up, where we have an extremely high number of organisms that live in our area and nowhere else in the world. And so we are one of the, the red zones are the biodiversity hotspots of the world. And so Southern California, and not as much the rest of the United States, but there, there's a few little spots, but Southern California specifically is a biodiversity hotspot where we have a lot of things that live here and nowhere else in the world. And yet we're developing and building all over the place. And so a lot of these are highly threatened. So it's important to pay attention to that when we are, are building and moving forward with our state. So there's a lot of um, species that have not even been discovered yet, which is so exciting. And I just put some of them, there's whole lists of these of like new species in, and you can put your current year, but I just did the 2020 list cause it was finalized. Um, so here's a snake that was found or this rice whale was classified as its own species. This, um, so there are some whales, something as big as a whale species that are still, um, being classified. This orange bat, um, Obviously some insects like ants or this bumblebee, this tiny little chameleon, all were new species that were discovered in 2020. And this, um, this mouse deer, which is actually related to a more like a pig than a deer. But one of the reasons why you would want to um, conserve biodiversity or make sure that it's protected is that us as a species, as we move forward as, as humans and we're taking up more spaces and more resources, there might be future um, medicines that we need, maybe future grain, maybe future meat animals that we need. And these are some of the different um, plants and animals that we are now using as food sources in different places because of how they breed or the type of meat or fur. Um, that can potentially be used. And so there's reason to conserve those selfishly for us as humans. Um, this is also some examples of pharmaceutical uh, plants that we have used recently that we would want to conserve biodiversity for. So there's lots of uh, benefits. These are some of them, um, you know, pollination, controlling pest disease, uh, waste decomposition, to get rid of our waste, air and water, purification, sh shelter, food. All of these are reasons, and my favorite, cultural and aesthetic beauty, just because it's pretty to have biodiversity, um, we would want to save it. So in previous chapters, we talked about keystone species. That's where it's a top animal that kind of has a has a cascade effect in the whole ecosystem below it. And then we also talked about uh, ecosystem engineers that that basically build the whole ecosystem for everybody else. And one of the videos that we watched was like elephants that really remove a lot of trees to make it so that grasses can grow. And when you have those amazing plains across Africa, that work is done by an ecosystem engineer. So when you go to different countries and travel, it's great to hire local businesses, local people that support parks or do eco travel or eco tourism because it really helps them. Um, interestingly, during the COVID shutdown, here is like the tourism revenue from in Thailand and you can see it was getting pretty good there. And then all of a sudden it really tanked in um, the closures. Now, local people that are very impoverished have less of a reason to save um, the local species or animals if they if they're not making them any money. But if they can give them a little bit of money from tourism or um, from people that want to go and see and post on their their social media or whatever, then it actually gives the local people a reason to save it. So I usually try to stay with locals when I travel abroad. So um, biophilia is the love of being outdoors. And some people actually have a drive to get outside. Like they'll actually feel cagey if they're not outside. That's kind of me. Like I feel like I need to get outside. Um, while others, the people that are staying more indoors, they're almost seeing a higher level of stress, angst, anxiety, and things like that from, and 
those are the same people that are opting not to go outdoors. And so it's kind of thought or something that people are looking at now to see if just simply being outside reduces stress and anxiety. And so it's something that we should really try to do and encourage kids to do and things like that. So lots of people, like the question is, are there ethical ob obligations to keep a species around? There's a lot of people that think that animals and plants just have the right to exist and they should be able to just because they should have a right to do that. Um, so when we lose biodiversity, there tends to be some winners and some losers. Some animals and plants actually do better with humans around. I'm thinking pigeons or coyotes, things like that, will actually thrive when, you know, cockroaches, ants do well with humans around. But then there's some animals that do terrible um, when humans around. And those tend to be larger animals that need a large space to roam. They need privacy for breeding and for raising their young. Um, they don't want you coming around and making a bunch of social media posts about them. They just need their space to get away. So there tends to be winners and losers, and it would be good to kind of look at that list and understand it a little bit. Um, as populations shrink, their DNA will be, be, be lost over time. And we actually have seen a decrease in populations in the world in the last 30 to 40 years. Um, once an animal or plant dies out completely, um, that is called extinction, which you, I'm sure you already know. Um, extinction is generally permanent and, and it's hard to, you know, make up for that lost biodiversity. In the, on the planet, we, if you look at what's called the background extinction rates, how many species normally, like not counting the last like thousand years, how many species died um, over each time period since the planet's existence. And we would have about one, um, one out of every one to 10 million mammals and marine, marine mammals went extinct each year. However, we're 10 times that rate right now. So scientists consider this a mass extinction because we're losing 10 to 100 different animals and plants every single year. So specifically on the UN red list, which, you know, has the threatened animals like threatened with extinction, 22 of our total mammals are on this extinction list, you know, like, um, threatened or endangered species list. 13% are birds, 18 are reptiles percent, 33% of all of our amphibians and 14% of all of our fish. Obviously there's some problems with this, especially with some of these species that we eat really re readily that we just don't, won't have them in the future. So habitat loss is one of the greatest, um, threats to losing our biodiversity. One of the things that we do a lot in California is we do habitat fragmentation. And instead of keeping one area that's connected to other areas that's green, we kind of fragment it into patches and that makes it really hard for a lot of animals to exist. This is an area around um, where I live and you can see that we have some brown like wild space hills but then it's very intermittent and spread apart. So like a coyote that lives here is gonna have a hard time breeding with a coyote that lives over here because they have to cross a freeway, several roads, housing tracks, etc. So it just decreases their habitat loss. It gets fragmented. So wetlands are one of the biggest losses of biodiversity that we have. And wetlands actually filter and clean out pollutants faster than any other ecosystem. So in Southern California, a lot of the problems is that we have drained a lot of the wetlands because we wanted to have nice ocean beach front properties. But some of those wetlands are now being restored, like the San Alejo Ecological Preserve that you can go and hike. Annie's Canyon Trail is right there. It's really pretty. And it's a, this is more like a walk, like a one mile walk. And you can see these like really cool views. You can go up different, um, like along these trails, along the lagoon and up some 
ladders to go through these like slotted types of canyons and it's pretty it's about a one mile little loop that you can go and see that so there's some areas that are being restored so pollution harms lots of other organisms here's a whole list but some you wouldn't even think is like noise or light pollution some animals just don't deal well with noise or lights if they're like a dark you know a species that likes it dark or quiet or or anything else. Um, also, ocean plastics is a huge problem. They can drown, choke marine mammals. It's really sad. Um, so there's a lot of major causes of of biodiversity, um, and and reasons why people do that. Some are overfishing. Some it's because people like like the local meat that is in an area. And, and they will eat what's called bush meat. Um, tons of sharks are killed every year for like shark fin soup or like certain trees that take a long time to grow will be highly sought after for how nice their wood is. Um, poaching can occur, which will kill the animal in taking their tusks um, and used for different reasons. It's really sad and not necessary. Um, invasive species coming in will um, kill the native species. We've talked about that in other chapters. Um, and then we have talked about, but we can talk about again, like climate change and how our climate is, is changing and that affects different, different animals. Like one, like the polar bear here, one of the things that they have seen is that some polar bears are, are making their dens near like oil rigs and the oil rig makes a constant knocking sound and the females after she gives birth will just sometimes abandon her pups because she can't stand the incessant knocking sounds but her pups are too young to leave so is some things like that are really really sad and we can probably do a lot better as a species so this video here talks about um the can the frog apocalypse i will go back be stopped by a new vaccine um i recommend you watch that video i think it's great so conservation biology is basically studying the like loss protection and restoration of different species and their biodiversity one thing that scientists study is what is the viable population size like how many do we need of a certain plant or animal so that it can still breed and have a healthy population? And making sure that's established in an area is really important. Again, it's that species abundance. We can't just go and put put one mountain lion in a space and hope, hope that they're okay. They need to have like a, appropriate resources, but also appropriate numbers of mountain lions to establish like a certain space. So different um, endangered species act is an act that identifies endangered and threatened species and um, all government agencies have to work to um, follow the law on this and make sure that they are protecting threatened and endangered species. Two animals that we have locally here in Southern California are the kestrel and the peregrine falcon, which are on the endangered species list. Um, I do have two really good videos, the ESA 101 and this one that talks about um, endangered species and their habitats and how the Endangered Species Act works. Um, sometimes the, it's conservation happens voluntarily as well. So that's all I wanted to go over in this video. There's um, a few other videos that I would recommend, but I will put them in our Google class.